As I've said before, I really like Turkish Airlines. Their new business class on the 787 was fantastic. But here literally everything was against them. A red-eye flight in economy taking off at 1.30am that only lasted 4 hours. Unprepared ground staff and lacking facilities at the new Istanbul airport. But I still managed to enjoy the flight despite all of this. Let's see how and why. To say that this new airport has had its share of political controversy is an understatement. It cost $12 billion and 55 people their lives. I took the bus straight from Sultanahmet to the airport for 18 lira, which leaves every half hour 24-7. The initial impression of the airport is that it is huge, unnecessarily big, just big for the sake of being big. I went to my check-in area and used the machine to check in. I had two flights on my itinerary, from Istanbul to Dubai on Turkish, and Dubai to Calcutta on Air India. Only my Turkish boarding pass would print, and the machine couldn't check me in on my subsequent flight. The ground staff were quite cranky, unhelpful, and confused, claiming to have never heard of Air India and ignorant of the fact that it was part of Star Alliance. In part, this was an Air India issue, but am I seriously the first person who's ever connected between these airlines? When checking in my baggage, there was no allowed weight limit listed on the reservation, and I had to check on my United Award ticket. After security, you enter the main hall. It is massive, and there are no moving walkways. Here you start to see what the main purpose of the airport is. The entire length of the main hall is a duty-free shop. Yes, there are some restaurants as well, but it's duty-free everywhere. Once you exit the main hall and start to go down one of the concourses towards the gates, there are finally some moving walkways. But the breaks between them are large, and at every instance, there's a duty-free shop waiting for you. It's abundantly clear that the entire layout is not designed for a pleasant or comfortable customer experience. It is designed to get you into a duty-free shop. Fine, I'll bite. I had a few extra lira in my pocket. It's always a fun game to try to spend your last currency as efficiently as possible. But no, none of the duty-free shops accepted Turkish Lira. That's right, this great nationalist symbol doesn't even accept their own national currency, only Euros. Erdogan, buddy, I see what you're doing here. You know how weak the Lira is. Is this airport all just an expensive ploy to get some hard currency? Well, I think it is, and I'm not afraid to say so. The seating area frankly appears to be an afterthought. While there are power ports by the seats, the seats appeared quite cheap and uncomfortable. Despite being brand new, the faucets in the men's room were already coming apart. It's just quite evident where all the effort went. I had first gone to the IGA lounge, which accepts priority pass. It looked very nice. However, the food wasn't that great and I was glad to have had my last meal in the city. The desserts were good though. The Wi-Fi was pretty slow and alcohol was available at a separate bar with the basics. To get from the lounge to my gate, walking at full speed and using every moving walkway took 28 minutes. Boarding was originally an organized affair by seat row. But about halfway through, they just said hell with it, and all three lines of people boarded simultaneously. Economy is laid out in a 2-4-2 layout, and this aircraft had received the newish Turkish economy seats. This A330-300 had a short-haul configuration, with only recliners in business class. While the footrests were not installed, I found the legroom to be quite decent. There were no air nozzles at all, which is a terrible decision. The cabin was very hot. There is a seatback monitor with the same entertainment on the 787. Wi-Fi is available, though not free, like I'd had on my prior business class flight. 
There is a remote, though I saw the cables were frayed and I didn't want to shock myself. There's also USB power, and each seat had a pillow and blanket. Sadly, that's about all the footage of the inside of the plane you'll see. Turkish Airlines gets very skittish with people filming, and of course, with my luck, the gentleman sitting next to me was a non-revving Turkish flight attendant. A man across the aisle had snapped a photo of the cabin, and my seatmate leapt into action, berating him and insisting that he delete the photo immediately. So yeah, my camera won't be pointed towards the center of the aircraft at all. The non-revving flight attendant knew the flight crew, and they slipped him two beverage cans and some snacks prior to takeoff. One additional downside of the new airport is how long it takes to taxi. On the way in, it took 30 minutes. At 1.30 a.m., it was a bit quicker at only 18 minutes. Turkish had produced a video directed by Ridley Scott to hype the new airport and the city. Which is fine, I guess, I just wish that had gone into, you know, something actually helpful. Flying time was 4 hours and 5 minutes at 38,000 feet. So here's my question for you. This flight takes off at 1.30 a.m., landing at 6.30 a.m. with only 4 hours of flying time. Do you A. Not serve breakfast and let people sleep, B. Let people sleep, then serve breakfast prior to landing, or C. Serve breakfast right after takeoff? Personally, I would go with A or B, but Turkish went with option C. Breakfast was served 40 minutes into the flight at 2.35 a.m. Istanbul time. Turkish breakfasts are a bit of an involved affair, and this was no different. There were cucumbers, cheese and olives, a yogurt with oats, bread and butter, and a main of a brick, scrambled eggs, and roasted tomato. It was really good. Really, really good. The brick hit the spot, and the eggs were clearly only cooked at most an hour before on the ground in Istanbul. So I'll go ahead and say it. This economy meal was the best breakfast I ever had on a plane. Simple, tasty, fresh food. Just, it was unfortunate that I really wasn't hungry at 2.30 a.m. I slept as best I could for the rest of the flight, and awoke as we approached the coast of Dubai. We were in a holding pattern for quite some time, just flying around in circles. But finally landed just as the sun rose on a hazy day in the desert. We parked at Terminal 1, and I took the train past the massive Emirates fleet. I had just under 11 hours in Dubai, which frankly was just enough time. With an all-day metro pass, I saw the Burj Khalifa. Burj Al Arab. The Marina. Took a cruise down old Dubai. and browse the gold soup. So Turkish economy on this short haul A330-300. On paper it had everything against it. Awful red-eye time slot and all the problems with the new airport. But the seat was comfortable, legroom more than sufficient, and I had one of the best meals I've ever had on a plane, and definitely the best breakfast. I'd say it's an above average economy product for sure, especially compared with what I'd normally be flying across the Atlantic, or what I'd next experience on Air India. <laughs> I'm struggling to think of an economy product on the same level, other than perhaps JetBlue or Sri Lankan. Do you have a favorite economy product? Let me know down below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.